This is going to be too loud for you guys. My apologies. If it is, um, I got a new microphone that helps get rid of that horrible metallic sound that happened on my last video. Um, as you guys see, uh, I'm working on my Lenovo today, recording the screen. And I've ordered a new screen protector that will allow for the camera to be seen. So that's pretty awesome. Um, to this morning, we're going to be doing just a really quick warm-up uh, illustration, drawing, sketch. You guys know that I love to do warm-ups. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to be doing just a fun little creature slash uh, dragon uh, type creature. Um, got some changes coming to the channel. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, more tutorials um, and more explanation of the illustration process um, because, you know, I've got uh, a partnership coming up with uh, a tablet company that I want to take advantage of. And they've actually uh, wanted to partner with me to do <clears throat> some tutorials for their website and their channel and whatnot. So that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm not going to tell you what tablet company it is until uh, the tablet comes in and I've had a chance to really sit down and, and review the tablet uh, on my own uh, before I start the video up. You know, I, I'm a huge um, proponent of getting the right tools for the right job. And, you know, that being said, a lot of times these tablet companies will um, reach out to me. And based upon what I've seen in the marketplace, I really didn't have a desire at all to do a review of their tablet. But one of the devices that I use um, is branded by this company and I was like yeah I'd be interested to see um, what is available that you guys have and not to mention you know doing a partnership especially um, in this day and age is a good thing especially to help promote the channel um, you know, really grow the channel and, and eventually make the channel a viable source of, uh, of income. <clears throat> Will I become a full-time YouTuber? Man, I tell you what, if I, was making, <laughs> if I was making like 15 to 20 grand a month, uh, I might consider it. But man, I love doing uh, projects and illustrations. And honestly, I really don't believe that even if I did uh, have a huge following that I would stop doing, um, you know, professional illustration work. It's just not who I am. Okay, that's interesting. So what am I doing this morning? Well, I'm working in Photoshop, you guys can see. Uh, I'm, if you're interested, uh, I, I do have um, a really fun beginner tutorial um, using Photoshop, and it really explains some of the ins and outs of, like, this particular canvas, how to set canvases up, what these tools are over on the left-hand side. And I think I'm on video two, and the next video that I'm going to do, I'm going to switch over to my Mac, because I, I, I noticed last time I used the Lenovo that I just had some challenges with some of the quick keys. Um, and I, I want to make sure that you guys know not only the importance of quick keys, but also how to utilize them in an effective way in your workflow. Okay, so that's going to be the next video. It's going to be uh, on quick keys, and uh, we're going to be diving in a little bit deeper. <clears throat> excuse me, into the the world of the tool set. So, what is this creature? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just sketching. Um, I just landed a huge deal of a uh, of a job doing uh, toy design for uh, Warner Brothers and Universal Studios. I don't show a lot of the toys on here, and there's a reason for that because a lot of them, the the lead time 
in creating such a, a toy, it keeps blinking, sorry about that, in the lead, the lead time in creating a toy sometimes can be six months, sometimes it can be a year, depending on the approval process. And, you know, if I end up showing the, uh, you know, the toy, then, you know, I'll have lawyers breathing down my neck. So that's why I haven't shown a lot of the toys that I've worked on. Um, what I'll do is I think next time I'll grab some of the PDFs of some existing product that's out in the marketplace and you guys can see what I've done. You know, I've worked on Disney Racers. I've worked on a lot of their plush. You know, I worked on their baby program, their baby, um, their baby plush program. And that was a lot of fun. And that's when I was at Disney. You know, Universal, I've done a lot of stuff too. And they are a little more sensitive about showing stuff. So typically I gotta get permission. And a lot of times I can't. <laughs> I did a, uh, a 3D sculpt <clears throat> of a very well-known clown series for a particular Halloween uh, event and it was based the sculpt was based on concept art that was provided to me by Universal um, by one of their artists and I ended up posting the finished product as well as some of the concept work on Instagram and uh, you know concept um, renderings and ZBrush and I got in trouble for it so and it's merited I signed it at an NDA um, you know from my viewpoint I'm like it's already in the marketplace you know but you got to follow the rules, and you know I got spanked for it. So my apologies. I, I, you know you live and learn, and uh, it's one of the things that I never want to be accused of is not following the rules, right? As an artist, you're like, oh, screw the rules. <laughs> but no, you really got to follow them rules if you want to stay relevant and and. Uh, yeah, I don't like this. See, I'm talking to you. I'm messing my stuff up. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's have up here. There we go. It's more of a simplified wing. <clears throat> that goes down. What I'm trying to do right now, and, and this is one of the things that I want, again, I wanted my channel to be a little bit different. I'm thinking in terms of silhouette. Silhouette being, if you were to place, if you were to, fill all of this area in right here with black, how would that image look? Would it still be recognizable as the image you're trying to portray without all the detail on the interior? This is, of course, very important when you're working graphically. Um, graphically and uh, illustratively, because your mind uh, recognizes certain shapes much better you know, I can give you an example, like if I have like a triangle, and if I were to do this, and I were to say, you know, which one is the stop sign? You would instantaneously recognize this is the stop sign, and this is a caution sign. And this is something that you really need to think about whenever you do um, characters and illustrations, and, uh, you know, things that, that uh, you know, characters that you're supposed to have a specific type of character, um, different shapes, different shape language. You've heard that terminology before, shape language. And that's important, you know. So, like, right now, I'm having conflict because I like where this is. But, unfortunately, where I have put this horn, I think this horn's up too high. I really like... The placement of this wing but I think it's probably gonna have to go back some so what I'm gonna do is just because I don't want to have to cut and paste I'm just gonna go ahead and redraw it we're gonna go ahead and have this horn come up here and it's not gonna be as long as the other one and it's gonna kind of curve out just slightly and then we're gonna have this I, I see, too, a lot of times people having issues with form and placement and not being able to think three-dimensionally. And this, obviously, is something that, you know, I've worked pretty hard on throughout my career. <clears throat> you know, I, I think I've given you the example before of, you know, one of my teachers 
saying, okay, today we're going to draw from memory and, you know, what I want you guys to do is I want you to take a mental snapshot of what you see, like say if we have a nude, a nude model, yes, those do, those did occur in college, so all of you perverts, you perverts, you know, that's what I said, a nude, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I want you to take a mental snapshot, I want you to close your eyes, I want you to record it, and then I want you to uh, turn your chairs around and I want you to draw it. Draw what your mental snapshot gave you. That was a memory exercise, and then what he had us do was look at it from, let's say I'm looking at it from this three-quarter view right here. Now, instead of drawing it from this three-quarter view, I want you to draw it as if you're sitting over here. So you're going to have to completely change your perspective and think three-dimensionally in such a way that it, uh, it changes uh, your mindset, right? Because if you're looking at it from this three-quarter point of view, you have reference to look at. But how do you change what you're seeing, you know, in this eyeball and this tooth when you're standing over in this direction, okay, and looking at it from this side? That is a very useful exercise in toy design. You know, it helps you do turnarounds. It helps you visualize. Um, it helps you visualize. See, I'm trying to get this arm because I, if I put it up here, it'll be lost in the silhouette. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have this come down. Have that hand here up. Have that finger right there, have the other hand. Okay, so then, and have this other hand, he's come out, right? It's meaty on the bottom, straight on the top. And you notice how rough this is? You notice I'm not getting into the details yet? I'm waiting until I get a better gauge of proportion, size, placement before I go in and I start messing around. So now I like the way that looks. I, you know, I need to have some, not horns, these are not scales, I don't know what these are called, fins. I like dinosaur stuff, but I don't want, this is too, this is too humdrum right here, so I might go back and I might change it somewhat. Okay. You know, now that I'm looking at it, I do like this underbite a lot because it gives him a silliness. So, I like the way it's looking pretty good. This was pretty quick. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to save. So let's go to desktop. We're going to do Fat Dragon. Whoops. Fat Dragon, PSD, on the desktop, save. Okay, so I'm going to show you what I was talking about in terms of silhouette. So let's go ahead. We're going to add a layer. Remember, here's our layers palette. I've added a layer right here. I'm going to go ahead and go to full. And I'm going to sample. Here's my alt key I've pressed. Sample brings up the eyedropper when I'm in the pin um, slash pencil slash paintbrush uh, area. It's going to go ahead and sample. It changes the color here. I've got my color wheel and I'm going to darken this slightly. Okay. And I'm going to make my, whoops, I'm going to make my brush bigger. And I'm going to rough in my silhouette. You notice my machine is just a little jumpy today. I think in the background it's updating software. Plus, I'm using a textured brush, which is always fun whenever you blow it up really good, you know, on these all-in-ones. But Lenovo's been really good. Again, I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't pay anything for this machine, so I can't really complain. But 
I would love to get my hands on one of the i9 you know, processors that's out there. If they even put them in all-in-ones. I don't think they put them in all-in-ones, do they? Okay. No, I don't think they do. And literally, I'm just going in and I'm putting in some value on the background because I'm not, it, this, is, this has nothing really to do with the overall rendering of the piece. But what it does is it gives me a better gauge if the silhouette is reading clearly. Okay. And all I do is I just go up and I hide that. And I zoom out. So that's pretty good. This right here might be an issue. This right here, once I finalize the horn, I'll end up having to go ahead and, and do this a little bit better. I want these to read a little bit better. And this, of course, will be, you know, have like a that cool bendy looking hand thing. And then that foot right here. Yeah, so we'll have that like this. I know that in, in concept design and concept art, a lot of times you'll do a whole string of silhouettes. And which one reads the best? Because you want it to be recognizable from a distance. You know, even if I were to go ahead and copy and paste a bunch of these layer merge layers it still helps me out you know whenever I do stuff like this um, and definitely it's a it's part of that artistic tool belt that you know you utilize and again you go back and and he's reading pretty good so that's that's pretty good so let's go ahead and get rid of that silhouette layer and I'm gonna go ahead and add a layer and what I'm gonna put that right on top of my sketch layer I go ahead down to my sketch layer and I pull back the opacity. I like around 30%. And at this stage in the game, what I like to do is I like to ink. <clears throat> now, there are different ways you can ink. There's different programs. There's different ways you can ink. I, I like to draw and I love having this texture. So what I'll typically do is I'll utilize the same brush and even though I've said inking. What I'm going to do is I'm basically going to kind of go back over my existing drawing, pushing that pose a little bit. Maybe instead of this having kind of a lackadaisical smile, you know, he'll come up and I'll just continue to refine. And, you know, it's not my final, quote unquote, final, you know, line. I've still got some work to do and, and some refining and, and, and maybe this tooth comes up, he's a little bit sharper, you know, and maybe instead of just, just that simple line like this, even though that simple line is good and it's clean and it might work in the context of what this type of character is, he kind of feels like a dragony goblin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change up his skin somewhat because maybe he's got some little ooglies here and there. You know, I don't know what his his dragon power is. I mean, he's got, you know, I don't know what that is yet. And as I go through, maybe it's a broken tooth on this side, just for fun. And see, what's nice is, since I've got the initial sketch established, I don't have to stress about, you know, stress about the things that, as a as a visual artist, or even a beginner, let's say, if you've gotten the sketch down, you can go in and start playing. Right, you start playing and having fun. You know. I'm still, I'm still, I'm not doing this. You see that really hard line? With this Lenovo and this active pin, it's got a pretty good pressure curve. And, you know, whenever I first got this machine, I had a heck of a time dialing it in, mainly because I didn't know what I was doing. And also, the uh, Lenovo, this particular Lenovo, does have a little bit of an issue with the touch so just be aware of that so I've actually got uh, got a glove on and I've changed 
the variables on my pin. I've got a rubber sleeve around my pin, and uh, it's really, gosh, it's really helped out. Um, you know, it's helped me out a lot. So what I'm doing now is I'm just adding some details, just little details, having some fun with him, and it helps that I've drawn a lot of dragons in my day. You know, you look at something like this, and you're like, well, how, how does that happen so quickly? You know, and it is frustrating. And I remember, I remember my wife uh, getting on to me because I was trying to teach my son how to draw, and because I want him to, and my daughter for that matter, and I want, I want them to, you know, experience all the joy that I've had from years and years of drawing. Yeah, see, I don't like that. See, so needs to come back. And you know, she got on to me, and she's like, "Honey, you can't." can't draw like you normally do um, because your kids are, are going to try to emulate and do exactly what you're doing and when they don't succeed what will end up happening is it'll it'll be a failure to them of course she's an educator and we both are but I looked at that and I was like you know what you're right you know so don't try and uh, quote unquote do exactly what you see do it your own way you know and that's what I'm doing. But many, many, many a night spent looking at dragon anatomy and learning how to do dragons. And understanding, you know, what makes a dragon. Of course, when it comes to that type of mythical creature, you do whatever the heck you want. You know, traditional Asian dragon, you have mythical dragons, you know impish dragons that's what's great about drawing you can pretty much do whatever you want so let's go ahead and save <clears throat> okay so now let's go ahead and again I'm just putting in some of the details let's go ahead and look at this okay so now I see what I did let me look at the construction of the other okay Let's go ahead and have this come back. You see how I'm still pretty rough with what I'm doing. And that's, you know, that's by design. I'm still figuring out what makes sense for this drawing. You know? Put some little like boil areas that he's got. It's kind of like a cross between a a bullfrog or a frog and a dragon, you know? So, let's go ahead and do this. Good. put that over too far definitely be careful of you know where you put things uh, in terms of composition you don't you don't want to run it off the page unless of course it's absolutely necessary or if it makes sense you know definitely whatever makes sense do that okay so let's I'm gonna widen that pencil just a little bit and now I don't like this clean line right here. This clean line keeps jumping out to me. And I have to realize that even though I want to put a tooth like there, that would make no sense at all because here is where his bite is. I can't see it, but I know it's there. Right? It's because he's got this big underbite coming around. So this is what I do. I actually, I'm thinking about how... I'm going to address this because I want to be more dynamic, but I'm not going to address it. So right now I'm doing something else on the drawing, something repetitive. Typically a repetitive action puts your mind and your thinking cap to be able to think about different things, right? And that's what I'm doing. Okay. That repetitive action again, I go back to it. 
because I want I want so much to address this area, but again, I'm not quite there. Okay, so he's got his arm. <clears throat> Comes up. Here. Obviously, I'm giving him kind of a quasi-human anatomy here. We've seen that over and over again. Not quite exacting human, but you can see, you know, your radius, your ulna, you know, your upper arm, the scapula comes out over here, you know, depending on the, how I adjust the anatomy. Here's his leg. I want that leg to come down. You know, I'm, I'm still I'm still working in the basic shape area, and I want to be able to have this come around, and then his foot. Maybe he's got a yeah. That's pretty good. So, you know, whenever I draw something like this, I start out with a basic shape, and since I've drawn cats and dogs human beings, I've drawn dragons, I've drawn a myriad of different things, uh, you know, again, in my career that helps me figure out where stuff is supposed to go. But whenever you think of the anatomy of a cat or the anatomy of a dog, you know, you can basically work out, you know, where this bone is, where it comes here, where this comes here, and then you have the foot, and then you have the toes. So the way things work, you know, these toes will come here, and then here's where the toe is. The toe doesn't start all the way up here because you have basically the upper arm, you have the lower arm that comes here, and then you have the wrist that comes here, and then you have the toes that come here. So when I'm working things out in my brain, um, I'm thinking about anatomy, I'm thinking about physiology, I'm thinking about, you know, the design of the dragon, and then... Whenever I'm drawing it, I start out with your basic shapes. You can see that. And then you have this shape right here. So perspective, obviously things going further away get smaller. Things coming towards you get larger. <clears throat> so, you know, working out the toes, and again, feet, feet are notoriously hard. But if you have a mindset and how you want things to be in terms of anatomy, just go down and do the checklist. So I've done the checklist. I've have that uh, upper arm bone, and then it comes down to the, uh, the radius ulna, and then we have this bone right here, which is the wrist. Okay, here, the wrist, and then we get into the fingers and the hand. So then I come here, and I can just... So this is going to be a little bit smaller, and this is going to be a little bit bigger, and I don't want to repeat what I did here. Because, again, I, I zoom out and I get the character of it. And maybe this, this particular finger is pointing forward, like this. Then you have this finger that kind of tucks in because he's trying to balance himself, right? He's balancing himself. He's got this arm outreached, and it's balancing this right here. And then the tail comes up to balance everything, okay? And then this toe right here is going to be... A little bit larger because it's coming toward me and it's going to be curving around like so. And then I have that knuckle, knuckle, okay. And again, you know, now that I've zoomed out, I don't like this. This isn't working for me. It jumps out really quick whenever you zoom out. That's why you see me zoom out a lot. So then we're going to have this come here as more of a, a neutral. Yeah, that's more of a neutral. Okay. Good. And two, again, I, I keep telling you guys, you start out with basic shapes and you move into the details. That, that applies on every drawing I do. You know, like hands. Hands are notoriously difficult for me. I don't do very well with hands, but 
through time, through practice, and the things that you know we do as artists, um, develop our muscle memory, observation, you get little cues that you can do uh, that help you out. So this bone typically will go right in line. The top of this will go right in line with the forefinger. Then you have it come here. Here's the secondary fi uh, finger. And then again, you know, this one comes here and you have this big fat muscle right here. And I've got that final finger that comes here and it's kind of tucked under because again, I wanted this to be the main finger pointed forward because it helps balance everything out. Okay. Then I start messing around the thickness and thinness and how far spread I want the finger, but the basic is there, right? That shape, that circular shape. And here's that other foot that comes around because here's the bottom of his belly. It comes around. Okay. So now we're going to come here. Utilizing that same principle of perspective, things in the distance. And you notice that I'm not tracing over this because I'm realizing even though I have the drawing in there, it's still just for placement. I'm going to be continually correcting as I move forward, correcting my drawing. And even if you have to go through something called draw through, draw through happens whenever you want the to place the uh, anatomy, like the foot, in the right place. So if you go ahead and treat him as a sphere, right, like this, and then you have that perspective line that comes over, or not perspective, that lattice line that comes over, that other leg will be right about, because he's a little tilted as he goes down. So that's why I think I'm going to draw this arm. No, this arm goes a little bit up. I think that'll help, because this one's going down. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this one go up a little bit more because it helps his thought process of what he's doing. Maybe he's reaching for something. <clears throat> so we're going to have that come up. And even if you have to do this right here, just to try, you see what that did? It went from a static pose right here to more of a dynamic pose right here. So his wrist comes down, and now you get to see his thumb. Again, comes here, kind of a straight, and then this is going to be more rounded. It's going to come out and then rounded because of that muscle on the bottom. And that's what's great about drawing is as you move through, it is truly, and I want that pinky to be kind of out, because he's like, hmm. See how that works? So, let's go ahead and do the tail. Let's get that other. Eh, see. I don't want to do too much here. So I have that. And have that tail come out, because it's part of him. It's not a separate attached entity. All right. And I've seen it happen over and over again. You know, you make the tail too thick, you make it too thin, make it too long. You know, I like I like having it this long because again, you have this curve, this curve. You have dynamic opposing curves. Okay? And that helps the illustration um, you know, have variety. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to drag it into another program called Clip Studio Paint. Clip Studio Paint has a new feature for recording the screen. Ah, uh, now I know what I'm going to do. Yeah, see, so I'm just going to have these 
is lip curl under, and I'm going to have a little bit of a line right here to help accentuate that. Now, again, whenever it comes to perspective lines, <clears throat> and you're looking at things in the distance as they curve away, and whenever they're coming towards you, and depending on the form, because the form of this lip, it comes toward me here, okay? It comes toward me on the bottom, and then whenever it's uh, right here, it's starting to go away. And then right here, it's toward me. So the curves are going to change direction depending on where you are as a viewer. So it's like here's where it would be straight. So you never want to have that straight line because you'll kill the form. Okay. Good. Okay, he looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drag you over into Clip Studio Paint. You know, I want to, I don't know. I really like this brush. I like this brush. So let's go ahead. I'm going to see if there's a recording feature in Photoshop. I think there is. And if there is, I'm going to do that because the inking process is a little bit longer and arduous than what I care to share. Even though it is important, you know, variation of line weight, placement, simplification, right? I'm not, I'm not tracing, I'm not overdrawing, I'm pushing, pulling the pose, all of these things that you should remember. You know, items in the foreground will have a darker line than items in the background. Um, maybe it's, yeah, there we go. Even putting these lines on this particular part of the drawing really helps accentuate the form without putting any value in at all. Okay, maybe he's got a he's got a kind of a wild whoop, kind of a furry yeah, I think he looks cool. Okay. Alright, so let me go ahead and See if I can't find the time lapse feature, and you can watch me put in the ink drawing. And then, um, what I like about Clip Studio Paint is how fast I can ink stuff, coupled with the color. Uh, you know, the color, putting in the color. <laughs> can't talk this morning. So, let me do that really quick and see what I can come up with. If I come back instantly, then you'll know that I just didn't like what I saw and I'm just gonna do it, right? Okay. Yeah, that's turned out pretty good. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that and we'll be right back. Either time-lapse in Clip Studio Paint and then I'll finalize the inking and go from there. If you haven't watched it already, um, have a look at the wasp drawing I did. I started out in Clip Studio Paint and eventually I ended up, um, I really liked a lot of the things in Clip Studio, but what ended up happening is since I wanted it to match an existing drawing that I did, which was, of course, the Ant-Man. Um, the Ant-Man had brushes in there that I had, uh, that I had done and used in Procreate. So that's why I switched over to Procreate. So my apologies for that. But uh, let's go ahead and drag this over and start inking it.
Clip Studio Paint, um, as you saw from the time lapse. And I'm kind of at that stage now where I'm kind of deciding on what program I really want to go ahead forward with. I love Clip Studio Paint, don't get me wrong, I use it a lot. But the brush in here is not, I don't want to say it's not great, but it is. But, you know, I look at this and I'm thinking I really want to go in and mess around with, um, you know, the brush that I utilize in Photoshop for sketching. You know, because I want to have a texture to it. And I'm sure if I go through here and I start messing around in some of the, you know, and still, here's a texture blender. That's pretty good. Tapered watercolor. Then we go in and we have thick paint with pointillism, some dry gouache. I like all of these, but I think that for putting in some of my shadow work and putting in some of the uh, textures, I think I might just go ahead and open this up in Photoshop. For those of you who utilize those programs quite a bit, you know that each one has its proprietary file type. Photoshop has PSD. Clip Studio Paint has its, uh, I think it's CSP, but what's really cool again about Clip Studio Paint is you can save as a Photoshop document and over here on the right hand side it preserves your layer transparency effects and like I have clipping masks here and it will preserve those whenever I transfer over. Um, yeah, transfer over. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going back and I'm putting in some of the little details uh, that I think the piece needs. And what I'm going to do for you guys is to go ahead and possibly put it on, um, you know, put it on time lapse as I block in the shadows. Then again, I don't know. I might not do that. I might go ahead and, and put everything in as as, uh, as a standard time. So I'm looking at the piece. I'm trying to determine what I want the background to be. The opposite, typically, of your red is going to be green. But this is in the pink range, purple range, and again, you know, having that opposite to really make it pop. I kind of like this color right here, so let's try this color, just for giggles. Hmm. It's not bad. Now what I'll do is I'll take my eraser and I'll make sure that it has a taper on it, which it does. And I'll just start erasing in some little... Just to give it a little bit of a... some life here. And what I can do is over here in the layers. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and transform this. Edit. Transform. Scale. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. I need to watch my silhouette here. I've already started to... Yeah, like, see some of these areas. I want that hand to show. I want the wing to show. You know, this foot, I definitely want to show. Okay. Placing it in the right spot, you don't want tangents. Okay. That's pretty good. So now what I'll do is I'll come back, I'll lock the transparency. That's this little thing right here, it says lock transparent pixels, boom. So now anything that I draw, or shade, or do whatever, is going to show up only in the area that has pixels in it. So I'm going to have a little bit lighter, maybe a little bit of yellow in here. Let's go to the airbrush, soft, make sure that I have that on. I'll increase the size. And just that little bit of hue in there will literally cause her to pop off the page quite a bit. Well, the canvas a little bit more. Okay. 
there's a couple things I can do as far as shadowing goes, and I, you guys do know that I love my textures. You know what, I'm going to go ahead and stay in Clip Studio Paint, just because I'm in here. Okay, now, since I've created layer masks all the way up, and it refers to this particular layer, they're all on top of that one. Go ahead and save my document. I want to put a shadow layer in. So, I want the shadow layer to be on the top of all of these. There's a couple ways I can do this. I can hit my control, I can select, it'll select this gray right here, okay, that I have, that I've placed all of my color flats on, and I can go on top of this, and I can add a layer, and it's not a layer transparency, and basically I can go ahead, and it'll stay within the confines of the little marching ants, which is fine and dandy, but let's go ahead and uh, go to select, deselect. What I really want to do is just go ahead and utilize that feature because there's, whenever you do selections, um, there is the uh, aliasing effect and you can adjust that and that's fine and dandy, uh, but uh, whenever you go ahead and lock that, uh, that uh, layer mask in, it refers to this and you don't have that aliasing effect uh, that could possibly cause a um, a, uh, a halo <clears throat> around your artwork. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to purple, kind of a purple hue. Kind of go down a little bit, dark. I'm going to go ahead and treat this to multiply. And again, you know, going back here to my brushes, I'm going to go to the color pencil. And you see... Anything I put in is going to stay within the confines of this gray silhouette down here. So, that being said, putting in the shadows, you want, you want some pretty simple shadows to begin with. And since I've got this at 100% opacity, let's go ahead and bring this down, this is kind of in the way. I need to think about where the light's coming from. Now, since I've got this backlight over here, I am going to have some rim lighting, but <clears throat> just for the fact that I've already got my eye shine right here, it's going to be toward me and off to the right. So, just what I know about how forms um, look whenever you strike them with light, you're going to have this area, let's go ahead and change the value, we're going to have this area right here. Oops, we're going to multiply. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and add. Boom. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the highlights because that's going to dictate my shadows. So, so we'll have highlight here. We'll have highlight here. There'll be a highlight here. His lip will be highlighted. This will be highlighted. Highlighted. We'll have a highlight here. 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 As this goes down, we'll have a few highlights here and there, and we'll have this here, right there. Okay, this is just a really quick way for you to get in some decent highlights to help you understand where the shadow is, right? Okay, here we go. All right, that's pretty simple. And as I zoom out, you can definitely see that <clears throat> even though I haven't put any uh, shadows in, that right now it's still, and you can do this, you know, in your color study, and that's, you know, another reason why, you know, people do color studies. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that on, and I'm going to start putting in some of my color or my shadowing. This is not black, see, in the color realm. I'm going to go a little bit more saturated. Let's go ahead and turn that off because it's distracting me. And I don't have to worry about 
the colors it's interacting with because that multiply takes the hue underneath and it multiplies it. Every single time that I put another stroke on top of it because I've set it to pressure, it's going to multiply that shadow. So eventually it'll be completely dark. down here. Okay, for the sake of you guys not getting bored, <laughs> while I put in the shadows, I'm going to pitch on time lapse and you can watch the shadowing process and then we'll come back and we'll do some highlights. And what's really cool, and this is what I, I tell I told the students whenever it comes to digital illustration, look how big I can make that brush. Watch the amount of value I can put down at once. You know, digital illustration is one of those mediums that I think is very underappreciated. And there's even been some chatter, you know, is digital art real art? You know, basically all it is is ones and zeros. I think absolutely, you know. The plain fact that it's a different, just a different type of medium that you work in. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm doing now, I don't want to get too heavy into these because watch, once I go here, now this is just my blanket shadows. My detail shadows will come in here and after I get done just putting in the basic value range and then I'll go back in. And I'll start putting in the detail shadows. And I start thinking about reflected light and how, you know, the texture, the surface texture is going to be affected. And two, uh, you know, this comes, again, with understanding how, you know, forms are created, how light interacts. Tons of practice, tons of observation. You know, you don't get this overnight. This is not something that happens, you know, instantaneously. And even whenever you get out of school, you you still continue to learn and understand, or at least you, I hope you understand, that you don't know everything. You know, always learning, always trying to discover something different about what you do and how to do it. You know, I told a lot of the students whenever I was teaching, I said, you know, what you're going to learn in here is just the surface. What you're really going to be doing is kind of jump-starting your curiosity of this whole art thing, you know.
for today's video. Like, subscribe, and share if you like what you see. And as always, go out and draw something and have a good time. See ya.